good stuff. So I'll go ahead and let John Zach do some introductions and we'll get started. Thank you, Randall. So my name is John Zach. I'm a professor in biological sciences, but also director of the TTU Climate Center. We are in our 12th year of having the Climate Science Center at Texas Tech, also as part of the larger South Central Climate Adaptation uh, Science Center. And so we're glad everybody's joining us and we are glad to have Christina and Dr. Young participate in, in, in the start of our 2022 Science by the Glasses. So I don't wanna to take too much of the time, but we try to get these uh, going uh, during the academic year. If you on uh, Zoom or Facebook have people you would like us to contact to give to give be part of this, please let us know that also. Um, our role is to make is to make people aware of the kind of exciting um, research and activities that faculty do not only at Texas Tech but as part of our larger collaborative efforts with uh, colleagues at University of New Mexico, Louisiana State. University of Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma State. So please um, participate in that and thank you all for joining. And uh, Christina, I think you have a few words you would like to share with us. Yeah, so I'm Christina Mitchell. I actually taught at Texas Tech University for six years um, and now I am in sunny California. So it's a little nicer weather out here in the Bay Area than it was in Lubbock. Um, and I work at an education technology startup called Pocket Lab. So we partnered with the Climate Science Center today um, just to try and bring a spotlight on STEM education. I think one thing that we observe is that there's a growing need for education that connects the cool stuff like coding and robotics um, with those science standards. I think it's really easy to forget that the science piece is important too. Um, so, you know, my kids are in robotics camp and they do coding camp and all that sort of thing. But I think we try to keep that science in the S for STEM. Um, our products are pretty cool. If you are a science educator or if you have a kid that is interested in some cool science ed tech, we have Bluetooth sensors that will measure physics, um, climate, weather. And um, we even have a little one that's like a race car that you can do um, collision tests on. So if you're an educator and you want to learn more, please feel free to reach out or check out our website. Um, Randolyn has um, linked it in the chat. And um, of course, you're welcome to contact me after the webinar. Christina, thank you much. So also for those that are joining us, um, you can put uh, your questions uh, for Christina or Joey in the uh, chat or in the Q&A. And then I will be moderating that we will be going to six o'clock. So we have plenty of time to share and discuss all these as we, as we go forward. Uh, Christina and I will be answering some of these questions depending upon the types of questions you ask. So um, we're very glad to have Dr. Young with us tonight. I've known uh, him since he joined Texas Tech almost eight years ago now. He is a turf grass specialist over in plant and soil science. He's a great person to work with, very energetic. And if you wanna know anything about turf grass and everything about turf grass, Dr. Young is your person to talk to uh, in a variety of venues, but we're excited to have him talk about STEM education and what he does in terms of here at Texas Tech. So Joey, glad you're here and thank you much. All right, thank you, Dr. Zach. And, and thanks to everyone for the invitation to come and present. Uh, it's been a little while since I've been able to participate in one of these. Uh, I think you'll kind of see why as we, uh, keep chatting uh, throughout the day. Um, but I was asked to participate by giving a presentation about building excitement for STEM education, uh, more or less through everyday connections that we uh, maybe uh, come in contact with. And you know, much of my work, as Dr. Zach said, uh, really revolves around turf grass science. And you know, that's something that almost every person uh, can have some type of experience with. Uh, it doesn't have to be a high-end uh, situation or management situation that people have experienced, but many people have come in contact with turf grass. It just may be a little bit harder to perceive where and how that relates to science. And so that's really part of what I wanna talk about today. Um, just to kind of give you a little outline of what I want to cover uh, in my time uh, this afternoon, I'll talk a little bit about a little bit about my background and kind of what led me to the point that I'm at today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about challenges in STEM 
participation as well as diversity issues that we uh, can run into and things that we're definitely trying to address. And then we'll talk about ways to address those challenges uh, in different ways uh, through some research activities that we're doing and also teaching efforts. So just to give you a little bit of background about myself uh, in my pathway to kind of get to where I am today. As a kid, I really loved sports. Uh, baseball was probably my, my all-time favorite sport as a child, uh, but I also played soccer and basketball, and I played golf a little bit. Uh, the picture that you can see here, um, I'm from the southeastern part of the United States. I was born in Mississippi. I had an uncle that played baseball at Mississippi State, and he was an All-American. He went on to play professional baseball. And so I think that led to some of my passion uh, in sports. Um, but as a kid, I would say that was something that was a, a very big part of my life. And then whenever I probably got out of uh, the age where you would play more of the recreational sports, uh, I kind of got to that stage where you kind of need to pick something and really kind of focus on it to some degree. And at the time, we had moved to Birmingham, Alabama. We were in a completely different place. I went to a completely different school. I didn't know uh, any other people in my school. And so that was a time in life that was a little bit different. Uh, and so at the time, I really found a lot of passion for golf. And so, you know, I, I put this together and thinking about it, I, I believe if you were to have asked anyone that I went to middle school or high school with, especially by the time we got to high school, and they mentioned my name, probably one of the first things that they would have thought of was something to do with golf. It was kind of like, that was my MO. That was, you know, all that I really focused on. I played golf in high school. Um, I also had the opportunity to go and play golf at a junior college in Mississippi. So I went to a two-year school um, and I continued to play golf there as I began my undergraduate degree. In my freshman year, I was actually lucky enough to qualify for the national championship in Division Three. So we went up to uh, Chautauqua, New York, which is just south of Buffalo, New York, and uh, had an opportunity to play golf in, in a, a, ma a major championship, at least uh, in, in regards to a, a college golf situation. But at the same time, I mean, probably growing up for sure, uh, science wasn't something that I was really connected to in any way. I would say I probably even despised or maybe even disliked science pretty passionately. <laughs> I did find in the classes, uh, but it wasn't something that I found a joy and connection with. Um, but ultimately, um, after I went to my two-year school, uh, I transferred to Mississippi State, and that's where I got my undergraduate degree uh, in agronomy with emphasis in golf course and sports turf management. So my drive to go to Mississippi State was really led by those times as a young kid, uh, growing up, uh, going to Starkville, uh, enjoying baseball games uh, when my uncle was playing and really having a lot of passion for the university. And my passion for golf really led me to turf grass management. So it wasn't because I had experience managing grass. I didn't understand or know anything about how to manage a golf course or manage grass on a golf course. But uh, that's where I ultimately ended up going to school. And uh, at the time, Mississippi State was by far the, the most renowned undergraduate teaching program in the southeastern part of the United States. They were the best. Uh, people came from all over the southeast. Uh, classmates were from all over the place. And they came to Mississippi State because it was the best place to go to school. Uh, we probably had... 100 plus students uh, in the program at the time that I was getting my undergraduate degree. Many of us consisted of people like myself that were simply in, uh, golf enthusiasts, uh, people that wanted to be around the game, uh, continue to be around the game, have jobs outside, those kinds of things, uh, and enjoyed golf overall. We had a number of 
uh, colleagues. I had a number of student colleagues who were very competitive athletes who played high school sports and continued and wanted to go into athletic field management. Uh, one of those people that I went to school with, Brandon Harden, he is now the person in charge of all the fields at Mississippi State. And so it's really fun to just think about our connection that we had when I was in school. And just to know that he and many of my friends that I went to school with are managing high-end athletic fields or golf courses across the country. There was also a, a large subset of people, I would say guys, we mostly had guys in our program, which is something that we'll talk about coming up. But a lot of guys came from farm and ag backgrounds uh, in which they you know, had the experience of agriculture uh, production agriculture, uh, very big in Mississippi as it is in this region. And so they kind of came to school looking for something maybe a little bit different. It's a little bit ironic that uh, we're giving this talk now. And in about, uh, I guess, less than an hour from now, Mississippi State and Texas Tech are going to be playing baseball uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi uh, for the next couple of days. So, you know, with my undergraduate degree, uh, at Mississippi State, I, I definitely learned the textbook things that I needed to know about managing turf grass, uh, managing different pests that are problematic. But one of the most influential opportunities that I had to really put those things into practice were, was the, were the opportunities I had to intern at a couple of different golf courses. The first golf course that I interned at was my first time to ever work on a golf course. Uh, one summer as an undergraduate student, I worked at the Country Club of Birmingham. It was a, a, a really interesting experience. Uh, it's an incredible amount of work to manage a golf course, uh, more than I would have ever known as one who just played golf. And, and I, you really don't think about all of those things, uh, whether you're somebody who enjoys golf or, or you know doesn't care anything about golf. It does take a lot of work and effort to ultimately manage a golf course. And then Mississippi State had a unique program where as undergraduate students, we had to go do a nine month internship, uh, which consisted of one long semester and the summer. And so I was able to go and do that at a golf course called Spring Creek Ranch. It's in Collierville, Tennessee, right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. And it's a very elite golf course uh, with elite membership. But the opportunity was there to really learn some basic skills. Um, it really changed a lot of my perspective about managing a golf course. And I think one of those things that was the most obvious is the attention to detail. And that really changed a lot of perspective for me about the way that I saw turf grass, uh, because you start to notice and recognize little things that most people would just fly by without ever even thinking about. So over time, uh, you know, I, I continued on with school. I got a master's degree at Mississippi State in turf grass pathology. I went on and got a PhD at the University of Arkansas uh, in turf grass physiology. Uh, and then I was fortunate enough to be hired here at Texas Tech, uh, really right after graduating with my PhD. So the transition to go from a graduate student to a faculty member running my own program as an individual person studying turf grass science was definitely a steep uphill climb. Uh, but I would say that I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed my time in Lubbock. I enjoy doing what I do. And over the, my time of being here, uh, I've had a lot of uh, changes and priorities, uh, I would say, uh, with my family, especially. Uh, I um, got married uh, in the time that I've been here and my wife and I have been married for five years and we now have four kids, um, four kids that are four and under right now. Um, so it clearly changed the way that I saw a lot of different things about life. It also changed my time availability uh, to be able to do things like around golf and play golf and all that sort of thing. But I do love to be able to have my kids help out with different things whenever it's possible. One of the things I like to do with my undergraduate students that take my intro to turf class is we do turf babies. And so I normally try to go find some Bermuda grass uh, in my lawn or somewhere 
and each student gets a little piece of Bermuda grass, just a couple of nodes uh, that ultimately would produce leaf material and root material. And so they ultimately get the, the, the turf baby to, to take home and then they raise it over the course of the semester and then they bring it back at the end of the semester. And it's a lot of fun. My students really enjoy the opportunity. It's something that I did as an undergraduate student. And so I, I enjoy the opportunity to get to pass that on to my students now. And this past year, my kids helped me with different parts of getting our turf babies together uh, and getting them ready for, uh, for our students. So I think one of the things that's really changed a priority of mine or, or some of the ideas that are of highest priority to me, to me are, I, I conduct a lot of applied research. So that's just what I'm best at doing. It's what I'm best suited to do. Um, I get the opportunity to teach students, which I really enjoy. And I get to uh, pass along my passion that I have for either turf grass science or plant science uh, to those students. Uh, but I think one of the biggest keys uh, and challenges is really recruiting uh, new students to our program. Which kind of leads us into uh, the second point that I wanted to kind of talk about in a, in a larger perspective, uh, which is some of the challenges that we may experience with uh, participation and diversity as well uh, in different STEM fields. And, uh, you know, the, the comments earlier, uh, you know, regarding po Pocket Lab, which I'm really interested in learning more about. Uh, are spot on, you know, in a lot of different ways. Uh, you may have a number of younger kids that find a lot of joy and excitement and passion with things like coding, uh, robotics is something that I don't think I would have ever been involved with. But my wife's, uh, my wife has a, a cousin who's very involved with robotics. It's a new team uh, that's been developed in Nazareth. Uh, which is a very small community just north of here in Lubbock. So they've had a team for probably two or three years, I bet. And we've had the opportunity to go and watch them. And I'm always amazed at what they can get the robot to ultimately do uh, and the skills that they've built. And it's really driven, I think, each of those individuals that's on the team uh, to want to pursue degrees in engineering, uh, which is fantastic. But again, I think there's a large subgroup of people who may look at that, like coding, uh, may look at the laboratory heaviness of something that is perceived as quote unquote STEM, whether that's an education or career track. And they may just find it, you know, a little bit dull and, and not exactly something that they wanna pursue. So it kind of turns them off in uh, maybe a different direction. So that really kind of to me um, led to thinking about some of the work that's going on here at Texas Tech and things that I've been able or I've been able to participate in. Uh, one of those things that uh, is led by Dr. Jerry Dwyer in education. Uh, we had submitted a proposal. This was to USDA uh, WAMS, which I think is women and minorities uh, in science and agriculture uh, kind of specifically. And so for this project, we're working on developing and, and further developing traveling labs that can be housed at Texas Tech uh, with Sizer. And then the Sizer group kind of rents out or loans out different kits that science teachers can incorporate in the classroom that follow along with the TEKS and give the, the science requirements that are necessary for the classroom. Ours are really focused on, on agriculture because that's a predominant uh, scientific you know, uh, idea that is very prevalent in our area. Uh, but again, there may not be that, that strong connection that, that, you know, that connection with the students may not be very clear how agriculture and science really combine together. And so that's really our goal uh, is to show that for one and also to uh, drive further uh, interest, especially within females and minority populations that are, that are commonly uh, seen uh, in our school systems uh, in this region. So this past summer was our first year to develop some of these traveling labs. And one thing I would say that was the most interesting and meaningful 
was uh, just the interaction that we had with teachers. So we have teachers that are high school teachers this past year because we were to high school curriculum. We developed curriculum where they developed curriculum more so for uh, climate science as well as food security. And it was really interesting to just see the, uh, the passion that they had as teachers and also their creativity. They're remarkable at being able to develop lesson plans and, and have different ideas that are so unique. It's kind of our responsibility. That's myself, uh, Lindsay Slaughter from Plant and Soil Science. She's a soil microbiologist, as well as John Rayfeld, who is an ag education expert. Uh, it's our responsibility to just kind of like provide ideas and guidance to develop the curriculum, but the teachers did the, the bulk of the work and man, they did some incredible work. This summer, uh, we should be developing a couple of different curriculums uh, with different topics for middle school students. And then in 2023, uh, that summer, we would develop uh, comparable age appropriate uh, materials for elementary school students. So the goal would be to like start introducing uh, these students at a young age and starting to maybe maybe flip the switch just a little bit to start to show how STEM can be uh, formulated uh, into things that are everyday experiences, especially for our students who are growing up more in a rural area, because we do have a lot of agriculture um, kind of around us. So with that in mind, uh, we kind of have some similar challenges when it comes to turf grass science, uh, some similar and a little different as well. So I know uh, for me as a turf grass scientist, uh, when I was getting my undergraduate degree and also my graduate degrees, you know, common questions that you may hear are kind of like, wait, what? What, what do you do? Uh, you can get a degree in that or what will you do with that when you get done? <laughs> so those are questions that I uh, still get a lot of times uh, now as a faculty member. Uh, it's definitely something where there's uh, little no known, you know, aspects about this as one educational track and two a career path. As a faculty member who does research in the area, uh, I think one of the things I hear most commonly when I tell people what I do is, I know a place you can research. <laughs> That's kind of a, a really common question, or there's a, a question related to lawn management and that sort of thing. Uh, there's a number of different reasons uh, maybe for these challenges, and there's a number of other hurdles that we uh, probably have to overcome as well. Um, some of those, one of those, is, as I just mentioned, is just recognizing that turf grass science is an educational and career path opportunity and knowing where you can kind of go if you, if you choose to go into that field. I think another thing that we have to overcome more as an industry uh, is overcoming a little bit of a stigma. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Caddyshack, uh, but of course that was a movie that was very popular back in the early eighties and it's a golf course based movie uh, and Carl Spackler was the superintendent or at least the assistant superintendent or greenskeeper at the golf course. And so I think oftentimes there's a little bit of a, a general persona that kind of comes off as golf course superintendents or professional turf grass managers being Carl Spackler's. So I think to some degree, we're having to overcome that challenge uh, through our industry. And then I think one of the other key things that we clearly have to do is build greater diversity and inclusiveness. So we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that as we keep going. You know, I was kind of thinking about this as I was putting the slides together and, and really wanting to think about capturing different ideas related to turf grass science. And when I think about a professional turf grass manager, you know, some of the things going against the Carl Spackler image of what that was, uh, these are, you know, individuals who are um, highly experienced and educated in their field. They are incredible environmental uh, conservationists. They're excellent at conserving natural resources. Uh, preserving wildlife habitat, 
Uh, they're effective communicators. And I think more importantly, they are incredible advocates for this particular industry. Um, and I think just one example of, of such things, and, and it may not be something that you necessarily think about uh, a golf course superintendent doing, but here recently there, there was some uh, bills being presented. I believe this is in North Carolina, and I ended up seeing this on Twitter not very long ago and thought it was kind of interesting, but this group of superintendents that you see on the right uh, had basically gone to the state capitol in uh, North Carolina, actually maybe it's Colorado. Um, so wherever they were, they went to the state capitol um, and you know, they were able to go and present their case uh, regarding some different issues that were coming up, litigation uh, that was being discussed. And they were able to basically discuss in this political forum uh, and advocate for their industry uh, in order to benefit uh, using scientific principles and all of these different things. And so, uh, you know, to me, you know, I see these guys as, as being the real true people that are advocating for the industry. And they are also the people out on the front lines doing the hard work and uh, making sure that the rest of us can kind of uh, continue to enjoy uh, different aspects uh, of golf courses and also uh, sports turf areas. So one of the things that is definitely a challenge within our industry that needs to be addressed without question uh, are diversity and inclusion issues. Um, so this is kind of really pointed out. This is uh, an article that was published in the Journal of Agriculture Education uh, by Devin Carroll. Uh, she's a female who is a graduate student at the University of Tennessee. Uh, she's been working in the turf grass kind of sector uh, as a graduate student, and so she knows firsthand uh, some of the challenges that she faces as a as a female uh, going into a male-dominated industry. Uh, so, just some stats from that particular paper: the U.S. population is made up of 51% females. Uh, it's really wonderful to think about, especially this today as it's. International Women's Day, and uh, we definitely support and uh, want to, you know, put all of our support behind those females who are, you know, brave and and breaking down barriers uh, all over the place in different industries. The workforce in the U.S. alone is 46.8 percent female, but when you start looking at some of the major organizations uh, within the turf grass industry and the professional organizations, there's only about two to four percent female membership. And that's for the sports field managers, which manage uh, professional collegiate athletic fields, uh, the Golf Course Superintendents Association, the Canadian Golf Course Superintendents Association. There's a higher number of members in the scientific community that we are affiliated with uh, called the Crop Science Society of America in our division. No, but I think much of that really is like graduate students who are in that uh, there are females that are kind of pursuing graduate degrees. Uh, it's wonderful that they are there and hopefully that's a good in row to uh, get more females involved in in the uh, industry overall. Uh, but really and truthfully, this only points to one of our kind of shortcomings. Uh, you know, there's also a lack of racial diversity as well, um, especially in the leadership ranks of this industry. We have uh, many, many Hispanic uh, Latino workers who, you know, take time in their daily wage workers who come and participate in different ways. Uh, but, you know, we just don't have a lot of uh, those individuals of different backgrounds who kind of take the next step and get into those leadership roles. Uh, where they're making decisions and those kinds of things. So uh, I'm very excited uh, to be able to conduct some work with some colleagues here, both at Texas Tech as well as Texas A&M, um, in order to try and circumvent some of those challenges. Uh, we recently, last year, found out that we were going to get funding for this project that was funded by the USDA Employment Workforce Development Group. Um, I'm working with our turfgrass extension specialist in Dallas. Uh, her name is Chrissy Seegers. 
Uh, so she is definitely, you know, bearing that banner for the females in the turf industry. She's an excellent scientist. And I'm super excited to be able to work with her on kind of expanding those opportunities for females and others to get into the turf grass industry. We're also working with Erica Erlbeck from Act Communication here at Texas Tech. She has great expertise in, in video production and just an excellent communicator overall. And then also Dr. Rudy, Rudy Ritz, who is an ag educator. And so he's also at Texas Tech. He has a lot of experience working with uh, some of the you know, CTE instructors at high schools. He has a lot of uh, relationships there, uh, which we tend to uh, embark on as we pursue our work. So this really has been, uh, you know, I, I put a dream come true on there. I mean, it's just a, a lot of persistence and hard work. Many of you uh, have to go through the exact same thing, but working in an area like turf grass science, it's not, very well funded at the federal level, like some other groups across campus or even in my own department. And so the fact that this is my first federally funded grant is, I think, exciting and nerve wracking at the same exact time. Uh, but I'm very excited about being able to combine my passion that I have for both teaching and turf grass science uh, together. Uh, I get to work with some really amazing collaborators uh, who kind of embody uh, some of these different uh, challenges that we are experiencing. So whether that's women in our turf grass industry or those minorities uh, in our turf grass industry, you know, we have the opportunity to hopefully reach them, uh, to advocate for the profession and just make sure that people know that it's an option uh, because that to me, I think is one of the key pieces of the puzzle that we're missing. And I think the beauty of turf grass science is just the fact that, you know, many students are going to have interacted with turf grass in some form or fashion, whether that's at their school, on a playground, in a park, you know, maybe it's just begrudgingly going out and mowing the lawn and that would be perfectly fine. <laughs> they do, many students at least, uh, regardless of where they come from, uh, likely have some connection there. So if we can build or, or maybe create a little spark of interest in science because of a connection or an experience that someone has had uh, with turf grass, then I, I feel really confident that will lead to, uh, you know, hopefully greater numbers of students coming into our programs. And if nothing else, at least, uh, uh, greater recognition, at least for turf grass science as an industry and uh, bringing science to uh, everyday people. So um, with that, I would definitely like to open up the floor for discussion. Questions.